All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Narwhal Pod. This is digital marketing and business podcast from GoEps Digital Marketing in Nashville. And I'm joined today by Amy Norton. Hey, Amy. Hello. Welcome. Hello. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yeah, glad to be here. Uh, th- I'm glad I'm glad you're here. Uh, Amy is co-founder of Giant Southeast, and uh, just a, a quick headline. I may not may not get this exactly right, but they're the trust experts. Uh, we might put this in the category of leadership development, but if you've got communication, culture, trust issues, uh, building in your uh, leadership style or in your team culture, uh, Amy's a person to to help unstick those kinds of situations. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So a- Amy, uh, we know each other going back to Gotham Group and now EO, EO Nashville, which is a great uh, chapter. EO is an entrepreneur organization. And so, yeah, let's talk about, I want to get oriented here. You're the co-founder. So can you tell us about your company, how it came about and what what we need to know about kind of who you are and, and what do you all do? Absolutely. Absolutely. So leader development, I think, is the generic term. You got that exactly right. And I, I jokingly tell people that I help I help people play well in the sandbox together. That if I were going to boil it down, that's sort of what we do at Giant Southeast. Giant Southeast spun off as its own thing a few years ago. We're powered by a company called Giant Worldwide, which is what when we met, that's the company that I was working with as a consultant. And Giant Worldwide and Giant Southeast are all about raising the standard of healthy culture and making sure that everybody has an ability to communicate effectively through a process of becoming self-aware for the purpose of elevating trust in our relationships. So that's really where we've come from and what we're focused on. Giant Worldwide has a technology platform and a lot of resources that help power the engine of Giant Southeast. But I spend my time hanging out with people in the coaching space, consultative, facilitated conversation space, helping helping make our conversations better. And we certainly need that in this day and age, I think. Oh, yeah, we do. I think we all need training. And I think everybody feels so much pressure right now. It's, there's so much negativity happening in the world. And so you're working not with leaders and teams or who's kind of your direct point of contact? Is it everybody? How does it work out? So if you have a pulse and you have any kind of relationship, we we can be friends. Um, But we, I typically am working with leaders of teams, leaders of organizations. I do work at the individual level, most often with middle, senior, upper level leaders. We do work also with entry level people, but it's, it's really about equipping people with a language and a process to be able to think through the challenges that we face every day. Okay. It sounds like you've got some options that would be helpful maybe for executives or C-suite folks who have maybe a good manager who needs to be leveled up. Would that be a good fit for Giant Southeast? Absolutely. Because a lot of times when you have a a manager who may be new to leadership or has been doing it a while, they've got a great CV or resume. They're great practitioners at whatever they're doing, but the leadership part may be a challenge you think about what we spend our time doing, we're driving for performance and driving for results. And when you overlay leadership on top of your regular job, then there's this tension that can become a little bit overwhelming where how do I actually lead people? Because I can't force people to do things. So how, how do I influence? How do I conduct myself in a way that makes me somebody you want to follow versus only follow because I write your paycheck? Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, it, I think I don't know. I've been an executive now for twelve years, and I just don't feel like I'm getting it right. That that feels. I think I need to be in your program and <laughs> use your services very much. So, I that's it's a struggle. Yes, yeah. It, it it's you you get into this mode of driving and focusing on the bottom line, and as the economy's tightened up post COVID and everything, I feel like it's made everything feel transactional to a degree, right. and and that runs against culture, right? It really does. Transaction will always be a part of business because we have to transact in order to keep the lights on and take care of our clients or do whatever we do. But when it's at the expense of relationship, that's when things become problematic. And frankly, none of us, unless you study psychology, most of us did not go to college to learn how to navigate the liminal space of relationships. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, I think some leaders do real well when there's a real clear, 
you know, flag to, to capture, yes. but they forget about all the, the hands and knees and elbows they are stepping on, on the way. Yeah. And it, it can become uh, detrimental to one's objectives. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's a much needed, um, area of growth and development. We, you know, we're, we're in a group of entrepreneurs with EO, as I mentioned, but um, it just seems to be the thing that everyone craves the most is to grow and get better and feel better about their own performance. So it's not, it doesn't just benefit teams, but also I think maybe the individual too. Have you found that? That leader development is important for individuals. Yeah. That makes them feel better about their jobs. Absolutely. It, I think fundamentally humans want to be seen and understood mm. and valued. And it's really hard to do that for somebody if you're their leader, if you don't really understand how to navigate relationally. So relational intelligence is sort of the magic thread that is required to do that well and to have people that go the distance, go to the mat if you're a Godfather movie fan, you know, mm. who are willing to fight through the difficulties that require a lot of persistence and resilience, those things that we talk about. Um, but it's, that's, I think the undercurrent that's not often addressed well. Yeah, that's good. Well, so let's dig into that a little bit. Um, so here, I'm going to read a question. Uh, we, you know, we kind of plan out our questions, but, um, this is, I think a good jumping off point here. What have you discovered is the number one factor that can negatively impact team performance. So what's sort of a nugget across the board that would be useful to people to learn, but what, what do you see as like the, what's like a, a big, a big thing that hurts teams? Yeah. All day, every day, my answer will be the same. It comes down to trust. I think in the media sphere, you hear the word engagement a lot. You hear engagement statistics and how that's on the decline and the drive for performance, but really, I think what's underneath ineffective engagement or poor performance is always trust. Do you trust that my intention is for you? Do you, do you trust? Can you rely on, am I credible? Am I a person of character? Do you understand what my intentions are? All of those things work together either for me or against me as it relates to your ability to step closer toward what we're doing or, or back up. Think, of, think about people that you have an easy vibe with, that it's just, it really doesn't require a lot of work to get things done. Chances are very likely that you have a high level of trust in those relationships. And if you have somebody that you can think of that it's a struggle to work with, they may be doing something in their communication. They may have something that they're not aware of that they're doing that's creating a perception in your mind that they're not trustworthy. And that causes a lot of problems. You, you said something interesting there. You sort of described it as understanding one's intentions. Mm -hmm. Can we dig on that a little bit? What What does that mean? Because I could see a lead. I mean, I'm a CEO of a company. We've got a team. But sometimes the leader's needs run counter to the team member. Yeah. Uh, some, sometimes, you know, somebody might raise a hand and say, hey, I don't want to do this job anymore. Can I have a different job? Or, you know, like so, something may change where they're they're kind of in opposition to one another. What do you mean there about uh, understanding each other's intentions or well, can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So I think we all create some kind of perception in the way we show up. So it's not just the words that we say, but it's our demeanor, how we carry ourselves, what the, what it is that we communicate, the tone that we use and those things act like signals. So if you were super focused on, moving your company forward, which you are. I know you're a very results focused, strategic thinker, thinking about the future of your company and the impact you can have. And that is wonderful to have that sort of big picture idea about what you want to do. When you are under stress, it is harder to do the things that are learned behavior. And if you tend to be a results focused leader, the relational mm -hmm. side sometimes is harder to manage. So if you and I are working together and you're really under the gun for a deadline for whatever it is. You may be less focused on making sure I feel connected to you. I'm on the relational side of things in terms of my personality preference. So it's possible that your extreme focus on the result that you're pushing for, which is important, may override 
how we engage. So maybe you become a little short in your communication, or maybe um, you say something that makes me feel unvalued somehow. And it's not your intention. It's a product of being under a lot of stress. But the problem is that what it may cause is a question. I might be left thinking at the end of our meeting, is, does he really care about what I'm doing to help our company? Or is he just concerned with the bottom line? I'm not really sure if his intention is for me or against me, or maybe just for himself. So anything that we do that undermines us causes a question of intent sometimes with people on the other side. That's good. So yeah, so sort of the, the opening of relational intelligence, maybe listening for, um, you know, receiving trust signals and, and listening to how trust signals can be received. But on to question number three, you all have a process for this. So if anybody's intimidated by that quagmire of emotional intelligence and relational intelligence, you all have a process to build and sustain trust within a team. Can you tell us about the trust equation? Absolutely. So trust is like love and hope and fear. It's, it's a vague word. It, trying to understand it's like sticking jello to the wall. So Giant Southeast has systematized and turned building trust into a process that is concrete and measurable and something that you can really codify in real words. And that's what I love the most is that we take something that's fuzzy and hard to understand, but it's like air. When you trust somebody, you know it. If you're in a toxic air environment, you know if it's unhealthy air, if it's pollution. So we've taken that vague thing and we've turned it into a process. And there, there's sort of three steps involved in being able to unlock and, and build and maintain trust. So the first thing you have to be is self-aware. I, I think there are a lot of people walking around who don't have a ton of self-awareness and they're not evil people. But in fact, rarely do I go home at the end of the day and say to my husband, I, I ran into an evil person today, but very often I run into people who are not aware and they don't realize that what they're doing is causing a problem. So becoming self-aware of the vibe that I'm creating, what it feels like on the other side of me is step one. And that is actually a learnable thing. We have this amazing neuroplasticity in our brains mm. as humans. So maybe I haven't known these things before, but I can learn and I can do something to engage with this new knowledge that helps me move the needle in relational dynamics. So self-awareness. The second piece is effective communication. So when you communicate, you're delivering a message and then the person on the other side has to receive that message. And it can be clear or unclear, effective, ineffective, but learning how to effectively communicate so that you're picking up what I'm putting down and we're actually making progress toward whatever the resolution needs to be. That is also a learnable skill. And then the final piece is relational intelligence. And emotional intelligence, relational intelligence are all similar concepts and they center around paying attention to what's going on with me and in me and paying attention to what's going on with you. So right now you're listening, you're nodding your head. I can tell that you're following what I'm saying, but if you were looking off into the distance or maybe giving me some body language, I might want to pick up on the fact maybe he's not agreeing with what I'm saying, or maybe I'm talking too long and I should actually be quiet and let you ask some questions. So it, it's paying attention to that dynamic between yourself and the other person and prioritizing what that other person needs so that they'll be willing to step a little closer to you. Wow. That's, that's a really great overview. I know for folks listening right there, that's a nugget and um, it's hard. It's, it's hard to do that. I feel like I'm, you know, in the audience on this one uh, of leaders who want to grow, be better uh, communicators, you know, be, be more empathetic and, and uh, perceptive. I think perceptivity uh, gets overlooked. You know, you can think you're in charge. I'm the one who has figured out and couldn't, you know, sometimes couldn't be further from the yeah. truth. I think uh, perceptivity is important and also a willingness to be responsive because we're either responsive or resistant. And if I'm responsive, then I'm thinking about what's happening and I'm doing something proactively to navigate it as opposed to just having some sort of knee jerk reaction and yeah. learning how to deal with that. That is, that is a playground for me. I love thinking about that with people. 
That's good. Yeah. Responsive. Yeah. It, responsive and reactive are very different. Re- reactive is almost like a compulsive response, but responsive is maybe could be a little more reflective. Is that what I'm hearing? Maybe. Um, I like to think about it. That responses are automatic, even subconscious, unconscious and responses are not bad. It's a, you're reacting to some kind of stimulus and that stimulus gives you information. So if I get angry about something, the anger I feel is not bad, but how I navigate that in a responsive way makes all the difference in how somebody chooses to trust me or not. So learning how to respond the right way to feedback or criticism or a situation where there's conflict, all of those things require your ability to be responsive, not only to what you're feeling, but what that other person needs. Yeah, that's good. It's, I think, yeah, the leadership opportunity seems to be sort of taking responsibility for the tone of the scenario, whatever it is, sure. even, even when objectives are maybe, you know, not aligned uh, because of whatever. Yeah. Well, so yeah, you, you mentioned earlier, um, you, you know, when we're functioning out of our core personality versus stress. So let's talk about this. How does trust come into play when effectively managing change? Mm, that's a big one. So what do you think the biggest issue with change is? What's mm. we're going to boil it down into a word or two? What do you think it is that freaks people out? I think everyone gets comfortable and likes to have, I think people like to function independently. Mm-hmm. And I think to do that, they like to know what's expected and have real clear signals mm-hmm. uh, about like, am I okay? Am I doing okay? Did I do my part of the equation for you? You know, did I, you know, did I ride the seesaw in the right way for you to get to have a ride? You know, I think everybody's thinking about that with their manager or their, their team members. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think, I think stability and ability to um, know what to expect. Yeah. Stability. Can I, can I, am I safe? Am I going to be okay? Am I going to lose anything? Those are things that people worry about when there's a change that's imminent and changes everywhere all the time. But the, the thing that I think is important is navigating it with relational trust allows people to not worry, are we okay? The situation around us may not be okay, but when you and I have a highly trusting, effective working relationship, we know we've got each other's back. So we actually can take some risks, step out in a, a different way, or be bold and try something we haven't tried before, experience a little productive discomfort when we trust each other, it's far harder. If I don't trust you and I can't get a sense of what the uncertain environment is, I may go into shutdown mode. So it's really critical when you're facing change to have highly trusting relationships. Yeah. I feel, I feel like uh, everything, you know, we're, we're part of an entrepreneur group, but I feel like everything sort of entrepreneurial has become even more. So I don't know. It's just been a high pressure external environment. Yes. For the, for the last couple of years, we're, we're at the end of 2023 and I'm just ready for this year to be over. Right? I know. <laughs> let's just mark it off. Let's just turn the pal- calendar page on to 24, right? I've never felt that way about a year before, but I just want to delete this year. It's just like, yep, yeah, nothing good came from that. It's not true. I've got a lot to be thankful for, but just such a hard year in terms of, you know, the headwinds of, of the economy and, and yeah. so many different waves of, of things. We're all feeling it. And that what's happening out in the world, we can't control that. It it is uncontrollable. And the only thing we can do is think about how I can shape experiences with people around me. I I do have some measure of control over that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So one of the things that we've talked about before is you all help turn companies around. Mm -hmm. So is there a story or anything that kind of stands out for taking a company and walking them through a transition or a turnaround or fixing some big critical flaw that they had, or even a leader, a team turnaround story where you saw transformation and growth happen. What, what, what does that bring to mind? Well, I've got an individual real win that I would love to share. I want to talk about the team story first. So I've had the privilege of working with a company for a lot of years now. And over the last five or six years, they've changed a lot. They've grown a lot and they're in the financial services sector and had a couple of guys who were serving as the partners wanted to bring in some producers as partners. And I spent a lot of time helping them develop 
a lot of relational trust. So we did a lot of work for people to understand how they were wired, how they prefer to communicate, what their triggers are, what it looks like to really build a great bridge of varying expertise, personality, skill sets, all that, really identifying values. And what I've loved is seeing the ripple effect across all of their offices. So they're in several different Southeastern cities and they've grown. They're twice as big now as they were when we started this work. And it's so fun to see them weathering the challenges that we all face, but doing it with a lot of relational integrity. And mm. they have a language and a skill set and a process now when, you know, things hit the skids and they run into some kind of speed bump, they're not having a lot of relational drama. They have a process to solve it. So they're not wasting time on repeat conversations that seem to go nowhere. And that, that feels like a real win because they are, their engine is on in terms of being able to maintain their culture and it's a great place to work. They still have the things to deal with that we all have to deal with, but they're doing it with a healthy approach. And I, it's really fun to see that happen. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Well, thank you. This has been great. We've got uh, one last question here yeah. and uh, this is our, this is our kind of fun one here, but, and thank you for being on today. Uh, but what's your favorite sea creature and why? And that's obviously a nod to the narwhal, <laughs> our, our mascot. His, he does have a name. Um, this is officially Norbear. The narwhal, I think, I think named by, named by Claire Hopple, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So what's your favorite sea creature and why? I think the octopus would be my favorite sea creature. They, uh, oh. they look, they, they sort of blend into wherever they are. And maybe the reason I'm thinking about this is because I saw a documentary during the pandemic and I read a book recently where the octopus was the centerpiece and they're highly intelligent creatures. And there's a lot more beyond just their surface appearance. They had, and I'm imagining I could change the world if I had eight arms. So. <laughs> <laughs> so is it the blending in or is it the having eight arms? What, what do you, what would be like the Amy Norton uh, reason to love the both. octopus? I, I, more than meets the eye, you know, what, what's underneath is not necessarily what's on the surface resonates with me mm. and I, I multitask. I don't think people really multitask, but I think I would multitask effectively if I had eight arms. <laughs> That's great. Well, Amy, that was awesome. Uh, thank you so much for being on the Narwhal Pod and for our friendship and knowing, knowing each other over the years in Nashville and, and being colleagues. So thank you so much for being on today. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. I enjoyed being here. Awesome. Thanks so much, Amy.